explosive discussions within federal parliament. Martin North, John Adams, in the interest of people. Hello, John. Hi, sir. How are you? I'm very good. How are you going? Good. It's been, uh, I think, about a week and a half since we've recorded our last show, and uh, no doubt uh, some of our audience has wondered what has happened to Adams. Uh, uh, all I can say is that when uh, there's a gap between shows, I'm working on something, um, and uh, one of the, the big things that happened this week as part of uh, a bit of a secret project I'm working on, I went to uh, Parliament in Canberra on Wednesday and Thursday and had a whole bunch of meetings. Um, uh, and we're going to talk about some of those meetings and some of those conversations without naming names because it's a, a, it was a very uh, interesting chain of events. Uh, I was there basically all day, Wednesday, all day, Thursday. Um, and this big project I'm working on, for, and this is the main reason why I was in Parliament, there, there's uh, uh, some big news I think we're going to break in the next few weeks. Uh, and. Uh, uh, we, we tend to sort of historically have set the agenda on a number of matters, so I think there's something new we're going to talk about, uh, uh, but, but more on that later. Um, but, but before we get into some of these explosive discussions I had, I have to say um, I ran into our nemesis, not just my nemesis, our <laughs> nemesis, Aaron Patrick. Um, and, and just if we can put slide one on the screen, Aaron Patrick is the person in 2019 who called you were conspiracy theorists and me conspiracy theorists because we attacked the Morrison $10,000 cash transaction ban. We said it was about negative interest rates, the elimination of cash. We quoted the IMF. Um, it was all academically cited. So this was not just making it up. Um, and basically he said uh, that we took a set of inform public information and distorted the debate and that the real agenda was about uh, what the government was arguing, which was about uh, crime and uh, tax tax avoidance, etc. Um, uh, and so he wrote this in September 2019, linked this to anti-Semitic groups and all sorts of r radical allegations against us. And then in uh, January 2020, when I went to testify before the Senate Economics Committee, uh, Mr. Patrick was actually there in the audience and he listened to my direct testimony, but he also listened to some of the other witnesses. And he wrote a second article, uh, and that's in the bottom of the slide, um, The Big Bank Theory Against Cash. And again, this was an article about me and my opening statement and how our audience was there, gave us a round of applause and basically said that um, again, I was pushing conspiracy theories, um, and he said it's dif dis difficult to disprove a theory because it, it, it hasn't happened. So you can always throw out hypotheticals. What if this happens? What if that happens? And um, he was basically saying that there's just no legitimacy to any of the concerns that we had. Um, and so since January 2020, I hadn't seen Mr. Patrick, and I was actually in an MP's office um, walking out, and uh, someone walks in, uh, turns around and says, John? I said, yes, John Adams, yes, um, Aaron Patrick from the Financial Review. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I just looked at him straight in the eye and I said, we, we won on the cash ban. And he looked back and said, you did. Um, and I have to say, Martin, um, that was perhaps one of the most satisfying moments of, uh, of the last few years um, when you can look your enemy in the eye, uh, someone who wanted to basically put people in jail for using legal tender um, and was willing to push uh, propaganda on behalf of the Morrison government when we can basically say to him, uh, even though you've, you work for the most, one of the, the most powerful financial newspaper in the country, uh, we, we still prevailed. And, and, and it's important I say we, because I did say we. It's not just me, John Adams. It's, it's you. It's uh, all the audience. It's all the people across the country, all the other YouTube channels and groups who came together as a collective community and said that this is the most radical. Because again, the Europeans, it, with their cash transaction ban, if you defied, it was you get a fine. Morrison wanted to put people in jail, which was completely nuts. And the fact that we were, over, over, a, we were able to overcome such a draconian uh, piece of legislation. And just so our audience remembers that Australia was the second country in the world to stop this. Germany first in 2016, we stopped it in 2020, started here, we broke the story first in the country uh, when, when the Treasury released their dis uh, consultation paper on Friday at 5pm 
Um, and it, it is perhaps one of the most uh, uh, achievable things I've ever done in my life. So, uh, so yeah, so the fact that I got to confront Mr. Patrick, uh, that was great. But then I actually said to him, uh, Aaron, you, do you know that Israel actually implemented their cash transaction ban only last week? Uh, and he said he wasn't aware. So if we put slide two on the screen, um, uh, unfortunately, Martin, Israel, um, and I'm not sure what's happening with Israel. I have a lot of Jewish friends. And I said, what's happening to, to Israel? They're, they're doing a lot of unusual things over there. Um, but, 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 but this article basically says, um, uh, Israel bans use of cash for purchases over $1,760. And that's obviously in US dollars. Uh, you know, Israel's tax authority, I mean, they get provided a quote to the media, quote, we want, to, uh, we want the public to reduce the use of cash money. The goal is to reduce cash fluidity in the market, mainly because crime organizations tend to rely on cash. But limiting it, criminal activity is much harder to carry out. So same argument in Israel, uh, Israel that the Morrison government used. We debunked that whole notion um, uh, when we went before parliament. Um, and Israel's uh, banning it, but obviously, again, um, we are seeing um, uh, uh, central banks are obviously getting prepared to move to a more negative interest rate environment um, because, and we're going to get to this soon, they're raising rates, we're going into recession, um, economic growth is slowing down, um, there's obviously talk that they'll have to take the gas uh, the pedal off the off the off the accelerator soon, um, and funny enough, only last week in the Daily Telegraph did um, former uh, chief economist for one of the big banks, Warren Hogan, call for the RBA governor to resign, not not because of what I uh, have called for his resignation, which is he's been reckless and l l taking interest rates too low. No, Warren Hogan said he's raising interest rates too high too quickly, yeah. which which is which is it just tells you how scared the banks are uh, when they're sending out some of these propaganda economists to catch for comment, and they basically say to them, go on the front page of the Daily Telegraph and, and basically take Philip Lowe out because his interest rates are going to tip too many um, households over and it could sort of damage either the bank's profitability or the, or the bank's solvency. So, I mean, uh, so, so at some point soon, this pivot is going to manifest itself in a big way. Um, and... Um, and obviously, physical cash is a big issue um, uh, because, as, as we've said before, if you get a negative interest rates, happen in Japan, people take the money out of the bank, they hold physical cash, and then uh, academic economists have, have written all over the world that physical cash and a negative interest rate environment t typically doesn't work well. Mm, absolutely. And it's just worth going back. I wanted to highlight for a second um, the fact that it was a ground-up, you know, community-led response that actually was successful. I think that's really important, right? It shows you that democracy can actually have a significant impact if you can get the right momentum and uh, effectively drive uh, the argument the right way. But of course, it's very interesting how those in high office and those in you know, public positions are able to spin and twist and turn and they get all of their uh, media agencies working with them and for them. Yes. Um, it's really important to understand how media actually works and how it's connected to the political agenda. Yes, yes. Uh, well, I mean, I didn't get to ask Mr. Patrick, how is it that you wrote two articles calling me a conspiracy theorist, even though we were quoting public papers from the IMF? But um, uh, no doubt he probably had a conversation with a minister and the minister basically said that uh, Adams and North are causing us grief uh, with their broadcast. So how about you write some articles about this? And no doubt, probably that, that's, that's the way these articles tended to come out. Yeah, and then just coming back to the other point that you made, which was about the um, reason why the cash ban is an important thing. Because, of course, if negative interest rates do come in, um, it can only get really work if, in fact, they can control money supply and money flow. Yes. And if you've got a lot of cash out there in circulation, and we've got more cash in circulation today than we have ever, if you look at the numbers, um, it's very hard to do that. So, of course, they want to try and get their arms around the cash flows to be able to control it in the situation where, in fact, rates go south and then they have to go negative. And I know that a lot of people are saying, well, on, rates are going up. What are you talking about? The point is, we know that rates will go up. At some point, they'll turn, they'll come down. And next time they come down, they'll probably go even lower. Yes, yes. Now, now 
we'll come back to that theme soon. But the, the one other observation, so, um, so, so, so when I go to Parliament, um, I have free access to the building, and I won't say exactly how that comes about, but um, uh, I just don't go into the public areas, I go into the non-public areas, and so I get to see the politicians face-to-face, -face. I bump into them in the corridors, I get to talk to them, I get to see the staff, and, um, you know, without being too controversial, Martin, you know, th 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 there is... Uh, 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 politics about COVID in the sense that um, obviously it's a, it's a health issue. Uh, people are responsible for their own health. Uh, we, we now are in an environment in 2022 where uh, people in public have the choice about how they wish to, uh, in terms of conduct themselves, do you want to be, do you want to have, do you want to socially distance? Do you want to wear a mask? Do you want to use hand, hand sanitizer, etc.? cetera? So, so you know, people have personal preferences based on their, health conditions and, and, and the perception of risk. But, but unfortunately in Parliament, some political parties have mandated some of these things, not because of an increased scientific risk inside the building. It is more a political statement. Um, and uh, that I found quite concerning because what, what made the West the West is um, science um, and, and, and questioning things and following, following evidence and not uh, I mean, obviously, pre-enlightenment in Europe, when the Catholic Church ran basically the entire continent, it was ideology. It was um, the Catholic Church was supreme and you can't question it. Um, and if you did, or if you said that uh, the earth was not in the center of the solar system, um, you could be sentenced to death. So, so basically, the, you know, I mean, Europe uh, basically descended into the, into the Dark Ages because they weren't allowed to question. They followed blindly um, um, and, and basically that they appealed... Uh, they submitted themselves to authority, um, and it took, you know, Martin Luther and a whole bunch of people to die uh, in gruesome circumstances to change European culture. And uh, you know, those lessons that happen in the 16th and 17th and 18th centuries are so critical for why we live well in the 20th, 21st century, and we shouldn't go back to Europe before the Enlightenment. So, 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 so obviously, wherever there is the issue of um, questions of science. I think science and scientific uh, evidence should always prevail. Mm. Well, it is very important, I think, that people understand that uh, sometimes there are other agendas other than the obvious one that's uh, running along, and there are ideological things that people have in their heads, which means that they see things in a particular way, and uh, sometimes what you think's going on isn't actually what is actually going on. Indeed. Now, um, just to take our audience back a few years, in, in the 2016 US presidential election, Hillary Clinton got into a bit of trouble because WikiLeaks got um, some, some text from a speech she gave in Brazil to a bunch of bankers, and she conceded that she has a public position and a private position when it comes to Wall Street reform. Um, and, and obviously, this became a big issue in the, in the 2016 debates because they said, well, you're here in public, how do we know what you're telling the voters today is actually your real position? And then if you get elected, that you are going to implement what you tell us today as opposed to whatever your private position is. So, so this issue of credibility was, was a huge issue for Hillary Clinton, and it's probably one of the big factors why she, she actually lost the election. So, um, and again, I don't want to say that anyone's sort of being uh, untruthful, but, but uh, what, what I can say is that when you do get to sit down with politicians, uh, in their offices and you have a conversation about the economy uh, and, and the problems facing the country, you have a different type of conversation than compared to if you were on national TV. Um, and that is obviously a worrying situation because uh, we, we are in all sorts of trouble um, and what we need is honest and robust debate. Uh, we don't want politicians to have a have a view in private, but also have a different view in public. And uh, if we're going to ever resolve our economic problems, I think we need to have leaders from uh, from across the society, whether it's politics or the media or corporate uh, Australia, etc., um, where 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 we're honest about the nature uh, of the problems where Australia really is, and what are the, the what are the right solutions. So, so one thing I can say is, is that in numerous meetings, I had about a dozen meetings over two days, um, what I said on this show over many years is what I actually told people in these meetings. And, and so I basically said, we have the biggest statistical debt bubble 
in Australian history. At the same time, we've got the biggest debt bubble in the history of the world. Um, that Australia's debt bubble is household debt, it's foreign debt, and obviously since uh, the response to COVID, we have an explosion in, in terms of public sector debt. Um, um, so, so, yeah, I mean, in, in terms of some of the other things, yeah, I mean, when it came to COVID, I said it was a colossal mistake. Um, the economic response was, uh, you know, it has indebted generations of Australians and the public health risk was not worth in terms of the cost. And, and I said that uh, now a number of politicians know about this show, watch this show from time to time. And I said that in 2020, we did a number of shows about stagflation. And we said that um, it was obvious about when they announced QE2 Infinity with the explosion of the money supply, that that was going to cause inflation. Um, and so it was no surprise to us on this show that we were going to have an inflation problem at some point. Um, and obviously it wasn't just an Australian response, it was a global response. And so for the RBA to have completely missed that we were going to have any uh, surging inflation, it, 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 you know, I said it was baffling. And I said, well, you can go back and look at our shows Martin and I from 2020 and we were and we were calling all of these issues out mm. so, so 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 yeah so uh, in terms of some of the other things I said now when it comes to the solution now here's where uh, you get a difference between people's public position and private position because I said in a number of these meetings if you can see there's a bubble and I said there is a bubble and in a number of these meetings no one disputed my statement there's a bubble even though Christopher Joy in 2019 disputed that there was a bubble. How do you fix this problem? Um, and I said to them what I've said to you in this studio to our audience. I said, you've got to have a depression. I said, you've got to, you know, basically you've got to pop the bubble. Now, you have a couple of interesting aspects with this, Martin. When it comes to the government budget, according to the Frydenberg budget that was announced in March, in the last week of March, the deficit for this financial year is $78 billion. So I said, if you're going to balance the budget and get public sector debt under control, um, uh, unfortunately, someone in this building has to go out in public and tell the Australian people that we have to abolish the NDIS, the National Disability Insurance Scheme. The cost this financial year is $26 billion. So, so you know, that program, which came in um, uh, around, uh, I think, 20. 13, 2014, um, under the, I think it was in, initially introduced under the Gillard government and then the Abbott and Hockey continued. So it was probably 2012. But, I, but, but the cost is so extravagant, it's almost the size of the defence budget. And, and unfortunately, I mean, even if you got rid of in the NDIS, you still got to cut another 50 billion to balance the books. And I said to them, health, education, and welfare is 75% of federal spending. Um, uh, and these areas are sensitive areas because particularly for the incumbent government, uh, the Albanese government, um, they're, they're, they're the types of policy issues that they tend to run on and they get elected on. So, so I was saying to a number of people, um, there is no mathematical way. You can't tax yourself out of the problem. You can't grow the economy to such a rapid rate that you're going to drive economic growth high and you're going to you know, generate more tax revenue um, that would actually balance the budget you've got to cut spending and you've got to tell look people in the eye and say it's not just a small cut it's a big cut uh departments some, some departments may have to go some agencies and some massive programs have to go um uh, and then when it comes to uh, private debt and obviously this is the sensitive this is even more sensitive because um statistically private debt household debt is a bigger problem than government debt and I, and I, and I said, to, said to a number of people, well, how do you shrink a private debt bubble? Um, and, and one thing I will say is, you know, in some of these conversations, they all agreed there is no distinction between private debt and public debt. Debt is debt. And it's too big. And it's unsustainable. And it has to shrink. Well, how does it shrink? You've got to default. People have to default on the mortgage. Um, and, and by defaulting by, by a certain percentage, the banks are going to get into trouble. And then, you have, and then you'll have a banking crisis. And in that banking crisis, um, people are going to become homeless. Uh, people are going to uh, lose their jobs. Unemployment is going to skyrocket. Um, you'll have to go through a bank reorganization program because you'll have too many non-performing loans on, in the banks. 
and you've got to cut those toxic mortgages out and 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 you know uh, uh, basically put them to one side and create a more sustainable and healthy banking system that can um that they that can uh, uh handle a whole bunch of healthy mortgages so it's either you let the banks completely go and there is a complete bank failure or you have to restructure the banks in, in such a way that you can have a sustainable economy and i said um in that situation you can shrink the debt bubble um it, it's it is a horrific experience to have a depression uh, we've had two um in terms of in terms of uh well in two big ones in terms of australian history 1892 and the great depression um, um, and in the Great Depression, unemployment in Australia was the second highest in the developed world behind Germany. Um, so, so, yeah, so I said, but if you're intellectually honest, there is no other solution. And, and, and I said to these people, but I know you're not going to do it because you believe it's politically unfeasible. So, and I said to none of them, even before you make your decision about what policies you're going to set for the next election in 2025, I already know what you're going to do. <laughs> Um, so, so, so it's already written in, and no one's going to actually address the problem. And that's why, unlike other commentators, I think stagflation is going to be ongoing over the next two, three years, both domestically but internationally, because politicians can't look the, their voters in the eye and, and you know, say, you know, basically, I've got to put you out on the street. And so um, now I did say two interesting things on this point. I said in Australian history... There's only been one political leader that went to the Australian people with an explicit deflation, depression, austerity program, and they won the biggest victory ever, and that was Joseph Lyons in 1931. And we covered this back in November 2020 uh, in a show called Only the Tenth Prime Minister Can Save Australia. So I said to them, even though you think you can't win politically, it's only been done once, and that were, and, and they won the biggest victory ever. So... That doesn't mean that if you try it again, uh, it's an automatic guaranteed success. You may fail. But, but don't tell me that it, but it's impossible to even contemplate it because someone had the guts to contemplate it. Um, and, and you know, yes, it happened. Unemployment went to 32%. Um, it, it scarred a generation both economically but socially. But uh, the economy was able to recover quickly. Um, uh, and, and Australia in the 1930s, had a much more sustainable and healthier economy than what the Americans did under FDR, um, and 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 and, and so, so so that was you know a, a really big point that that I that I wanted to emphasize, um, and, and and some people were honest and said uh, they were talking to me about other elections, but they said they hadn't really specifically started the 1931 election. And I said, well, we, we've done some shows about it. I've read an article about it. Uh, I recommend some books, and I said, you know, again, this is not Adams making it up. Someone actually, someone actually went to the people and said, "We're going to put you out on the street," um, and uh, and that actually worked. Now, I also told them what happened in my recent Newcastle seminar. So I did my seminar in Newcastle, uh, talked about all of the types of issues that we talk about on the show and a few other things, and then we did have the Q and A. And a woman in Newcastle, she basically looked at me and said, "So all the things that the government and the RBO are doing is not going to fix the problem." And I said, no, it's not going to fix the problem. It's just making it worse. And I looked at this woman and I said, if I'm your prime minister, I'm going to put you out on the street for 18 months. We're going to go through a lot of pain. But, at the end, but, but on the other side, we're going to have a more sustainable economy where uh, people are, 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 you know, financial stress is less. You ha there's less debt. Um, prices are lower. Um, and we're going to have uh, a more productive, internationally competitive economy. Um, that's what I will do, but but I will. Now, I didn't know this woman's financial situation, but I just looked at her and said, uh, I'm going to put you out on the street. Now, when I told this to politi when I told this street thing to story to politicians, um, now, obviously, certain types of people come to my seminars because they're, they're sort of open-minded about the types of things that you and I talk about. Mm. But, the, but the public at large, these politicians just looked at me and said, I can't do that. I can't say to the average mum and dad, person that signed a six or seven figure mortgage, I'm going to put you out on the street. It, you know, like it's just polit politically unfathomable. But I said, well, um, that's why the problem is going to only get worse. Um, and it's not going to get better because um, you believe that common sense and the unvarnished truth is too much for the Australian people. 
Mm. And the question, I suppose, John, is whether it's too much for the Australian people or whether actually it's too much for the politicians because they're too weak need to actually have the conversations that need to be had. Well, I mean, that, 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 is a, uh, that is another part of it. I mean, how do you communicate these problems? Now, perhaps you and I are more academic, uh, <laughs> and, 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 and I will say these topics are not, uh, not easy. They're, they're not easy, no. uh, and they're quite involved. And can you communicate these issues in 30 seconds? You can't. So, so obviously the, the, one of the biggest problems for politicians is the nightly news because, you know, I mean, uh, they, they try to engineer their statements so they can actually get uh, 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 covered in the nightly news. Uh, um, and, and, and these are serious, technically difficult um, subjects that, um, that require hours of discussion, hours of debate on national TV so that people can actually understand the nature of the problem. And that's why, you know, we've been doing these shows for four years and some of our shows... Uh, where we cover one technical aspect could be half an hour to 45 minutes because uh, because we need to get it deep into a subject. And even on the cash plan, we did, I think, eight or nine programs in a row about it. Um, and we went deep into the subject to the point where we, when we wrote our submissions and, we, and when I testified to the Senate, everything that I said on the show uh, is what I told Parliament because we did the work, um, and 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 that is obviously there is a communication problem, but mm. but 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 there's also the, just looking at people and saying the country stuffed and we've got to fix it, um, and it's not going to be easy. No, it's interesting, John. You know, don't whether you saw Andrew Bailey, he's the um, guy in charge of the Bank of England. He actually on Thursday gave a very um, downbeat story as to what was happening in the UK with the recession and you know. So he actually was um, seen as somebody calling it as it was and actually being prepared to actually paint how bad it really was, whereas most other central banks and bankers around the world won't go close to actually talking about it as being as bad as it is. So that, that was interesting. But he, even he, I don't think, was actually able to, to, to sort of tell the full story, um, which you and I have been discussing previously. Indeed, indeed, uh, and 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 yeah. So well, I mean, but but the real question on even on that Martin is, is it the responsibility of of the central bank governor exactly, yeah. or or the mm. chairman or whoever to 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 tell the people the truth, or mm. is it the the elected officials? Yep. Um. Um. And 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 here's where we get into uh, perhaps you know in, in one of our concluding points, a really big dilemma, which is democracy, mm. because um. It, it's it's a, a very uh, perhaps um, a bad thing to say in, in the 21st century that democracy has its limitations. But uh, 200 years ago, people were were actually against democracy in certain parts of the world purely because of what it means in terms of uh, people's expectations in terms of the public purse. Mm -hmm. And so I, we've I'm going to put this slide four on the screen, Martin. Now we've we've talked about this before. Uh, we, we, we've we've used this quote in a previous show a couple of years ago. So now th there's a dispute in uh, in on the internet. Was was it Alexander Tyler, who's from Scotland, who's a Scottish lawyer, or was it Alexis de Tocqueville, who was who was from France? But but I just want to go and, and and read this quote, which is a little bit long, but it's worth it. Quote: A democracy is always temporary in nature. It is simply cannot exist as a permanent form of government. A democracy will will continue to exist up until the time that voters discover that they can vote themselves generous gifts from the public treasury. From that moment on, the majority always votes for the candidates who promise the most benefits from the public treasury, with the result that every democracy will finally collapse due to loose fiscal policy, which is always followed by a dictatorship. The average age of the world's greatest civilizations from the, from the beginning of history has been about 200 years. During those 200 years, these nations always progressed through the following sequence from bondage to spiritual faith from spiritual faith to great courage from great from courage to liberty from liberty to abundance from from abundance to selfishness from selfishness to complacency from complacency to apathy from apathy to dependence from dependence back into bondage now um the two key things from this quote martin is is that um that we do have a problem with democracy in this country um, because just like whether it was Tyler or de Tocqueville, um, there is an issue of people and their expectation of government. And a lot of people think that 
um, all of this money, all of these loans coming from the bank, um, all, all of this public spending is is just part for the course. And people don't understand where this actually money comes from and what the consequences is, which is obviously the ultimate inflation and, and collapse of the currency. But, but also in terms of this second quote, I mean, I would say that Australia is, you know, that's why I put in bold, is from apathy to dependence. Yeah. A lot of people are not in, engaged in current affairs and, uh, and active, uh, you know, political activism, if I could use that word. Um, um, and obviously there's a whole bunch of people who heavily are dependent on uh, the government for all sorts of forms of support. Um, and in generations gone past, that wasn't the case and people were more uh, politically and financially um, and socially more independent. Um, and Australia's not that today. Um, and so the question is, can the solution, and, and, and again, uh, I said to one politician in particular, I said, you can dress it up any way you want. If you're going to shrink the bubble, it's a depression because people have to default on the mortgages. Um, because uh, when people talk about a jubilee, jubilees historically has been when government forgives debt. But well, how does a bank forgive debt? It doesn't. It, it, it has a banking crisis. So, so how can that happen in a democracy? Because if it can't, the result will be hyperinflation. Um, there is no two ways about it because the politicians believe if we go to the people with the right solution and we lose, well, what's the point? Uh, that's the thinking in Canberra. That's the th thinking in capital cities around the world. Mm -hmm. so, so, so where we're up to now is we will have ongoing inflation because politicians in, in private say, uh, now, some of them don't get the solution. Some of them understand the solution. Um, and some of these discussions I had were very, um, were, were, were very engaging, intellectually engaging, very honest, very robust. But, but, but the question is, can we fix the country in a democracy or do we have to actually consider reforming the, our, our democratic system? And, and what I would say on that point is, is that it's not that I would call for a dictatorship or that we suspend democracy entirely. But the question is, should every person vote? Should there be a qualification as to how do you get the vote? Um, um, and uh, is there um, a certain segment of society that if they didn't vote, we could actually get rural reform? And that's, I think, a very difficult question and debate to have. But I think that if Parliament is not willing to look people in the eye, just like we do it on a frequent basis, and say what the truth is, then, then, then the ultimate, then the only solution to save the country from hyperinflation is to look at democracy and say we need less people to vote because we're too many irresponsible people are voting in weak politicians and we can't and we're heading towards the abyss. Mm. Well, of course, John, it's. Uh sunny weather, the beach looks pretty nice, you know, the politicians will let them get on with it, right? It's not, it doesn't really affect us, does it? That is the apathy, my, uh, <laughs> my, my friend. Exactly right. But the point is, as we showed with the cash ban, it is possible to engage and to make change and actually, you know, res resist things we don't want. But we are getting into some very, very deep questions here, which are fundamental to our future. Absolutely. John, I appreciate your time today. Very important discussion, as always. Thank you. Martin North, John Adams in the interest of people. We'll see you next time.